And so now we're going to be going over the preliminaries, but first we're going to take a look at our preliminary verse of Brashith or Genesis chapter 2 verses 10 through 14 so we can get some context on the four rivers and where they are located. And then we're going to be taking a look at ancient maps and documents and sources to really see if we can document the real true location of Eden. But here we are in Brashith or Genesis chapter 2 verses 10. 10 through 14 that reads, And a river went out of Adon, or Eden, to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four river heads. So this first part is important because it tells us that it first started as a river, but then it divides into four parts. And do we see that somewhere? Well, let's keep going because then it goes on to say, and we're going to be using the names in the ancient Yaudiath language, but the name of the first is Payashun, or commonly known as Pishon today. It is the one surrounding the entire land of Kuyala, commonly known as Havilah today, where there is gold. Keep this in mind, gold. So that's the first river location. And then it says, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium is there in the Shohem stone. And the name of the second river is Gayakun or Gihon. It is the one surrounding the entire land of Kush. Now some translations today read Ethiopia. And we're going to be talking about that when we go over this river. But verse 14 goes on to say, and the name of the third river is Katakal. Now some some translations today read the Tigris, and then it is the one which goes toward the east of Ashashur. Now remember that in mind, and please keep this in mind as we go over this documentary today, east of Ashashur, because this is going to become very handy as we've talked about in our ancient Assyria video that was done on this a long time ago. And then what? The fourth river is the Euphrates, as it's commonly known today. In the Yaudiath, it was called called Paratha, Paratha. Now that we have some context on what we just read, now we're going to go over and see exactly where these four rivers could be today and also where they once connected. Because as we've gone over in the documentary, we've discussed this map that's well over 600 years old and we're going to discuss it once again today in this documentary for context purposes because it says in 1411, a Venetian cartographer by the name of Albertinus de Verga designed this very important map of Africa. Now again, this map is well over 600 years old. It comes from 1411, and we've gone over it in the documentary, but once again, we're focusing on it today because this map is key in helping us find the four rivers of Eden today. But as you can see, here is a sketched outline of it. And if you would like to learn more about it, I will link it in the description box below where you can learn more info about it. Here is the map in color just so that you have an idea. Now, for those of you who already do not know, or if this is your first time seeing this topic, well, you may be wondering why this map is so important. Look again. Because what you will see depicted on this map is the Garden of Eden at the southernmost tip of Africa with the symbol of two concentric rings from which emerge the four rivers that are mentioned in Brashith or Genesis chapter 2, what we just read a little bit earlier ago. So here is that actual depiction right here with the concentric rings. And here are the four rivers that emerge out of it right here all throughout the land of Africa as it's commonly known today. Now there are a few other things to note about this map and why it's so very important. The first thing to note is how one of the four rivers appears to be the Nile and that is right here. As you can see right here, it goes all the way from so-called Southern Africa all the way towards Egypt as it's commonly known today. So what? It looks just like the Nile. And we're going to be talking more about that later on when we go over the Tigris River. Now, the most important thing that I want you to know today in this video is that all of these rivers in Africa are connected. They are all connected to one another. And we're going to be talking about that more when we take a look at ancient maps that show and depict the Niger River 
and the Nile River as well. Now, what's commonly taught to us in geography classes and in our history classes that, oh, the Nile River goes all the way from here in what's commonly known as Egypt today all the way towards Uganda and that it stops there. But is that really true? Because what you're about to see in the video later on is that really there is even a so-called Nile River in so-called South Africa as well because what they're all interconnected and that's a very important concept for this video here is the full map right here that shows calendar plates now once again if you would like to take a look at this more on your own time you can take a look at the documentary and again the link is in the description box below so that you can learn more but another very important detail about this map is that it disappeared in the late 1930s from Heidelberg, Germany, along with its owners. And who were the owners of this map? And that's right, the owners were a Jewish family, coincidentally enough, 10 years before their fraudulent nation was formed. Now again, the question remains is why would a Jewish family want to hide this map approximately 10 years before their fraudulent nation was coincidentally formed in 1948? What impeccable timing indeed. Don't you see the bigger agenda behind that? What are they really hiding? What don't they want you to know? Because do they want you to think that the fake Garden of Eden is in Iraq and Iran so-called today according to their narrative? Is that what they want you to think? Is that scriptural of Events took place in the Middle East and that that fake Israel took place there that the scriptural one took place there even though it did not we do not have time to go over that today in this documentary about why that Jerusalem is not the real Jerusalem and why the land of Canaan is nowhere near that area because we've already covered it before extensively and you can take a look at our documentaries or true location series to learn more about that on the playlist on YouTube but what we will do is focus on more of the land of Canaan because remember that map showed and depicted the Garden of Eden in so-called southern Africa as it's commonly known today Remember how we've gone over the Canna land, local municipality in so-called South Africa, Southern Africa, which is where the Garden of Eden is depicted. Notice how it's located within the Garden Root District. And when you actually take a look at the Garden Root, you will see that that's what the Eden District. You see this right here, the seal. That's what the all or the Aleph and the Yaudiath Paleo Hebrew alphabet, which is the first letter of of the alphabet where is all of this located today and according to the Human Sciences Research Council from the Dictionary of Southern African Place Names that was published in the late 1980s if you go to page 107 this is what you will find the definition of Cana land right here also encountered as Cana land or what Canaan's land, the real land of Canaan. They're even telling you where it is. They're putting it right in front of your face that the real land of Canaan is located in southern Africa. Remember, we just told you to take a look at the Garden Root District as we saw earlier near the Eden District because that is what it was once called, formerly known as the Eden District Municipality, where in so-called South Africa, the same place that shows us that map where in 1411 of the Garden of Eden being depicted within the same region, Eden right there, Garden Root, Canaan, the land of Canaan. Canaan. Now, before we go over each of the four rivers separately, we're going to be talking more about the rivers and once again, how all of these rivers are interconnected some way, shape, or form, or somehow, either by tributaries or either by streams that flow within them. But again, the narrative that they like to tell you is that the Nile River goes all the way over here towards Southern Africa. But in actuality, what if it extends all the way towards Southern Africa as you're about to see later on and later on you're also going to see how the Niger River is actually connected to the Nile and this is a geographical fact that has been documented by geographers themselves and cartographers 
But just take a look at any map of Africa or even just do a Google search of the rivers of Africa and what you will find is that there are a ton of rivers in Africa that are interconnected and that are linked together. But of course, what the wicked translators and what the wicked colonizers did is that they started changing names of rivers, changing maps, hiding maps, burning maps, and then renaming all of these different locations, hence the names that you see today. And so what we're doing is restoring everything that was lost. And even they tell you that the Nile River flows so-called southward towards this way. Once again, another indication letting you know that what the map is upside down. Maps are upside down as we've gone over and talked about and covered in the documentary itself. But this is just another map of Africa that shows you all of the rivers right here. This is the Niger, the Volta, the Benu, the Congo. Zambezi, Limpopo, Orange River as it's known today, the African Great Lakes as they're known, and again, Victoria Albert, these are named after colonizers. What were these lakes known before that? What were they called in scriptural times? Could one of them have been possibly called and known as the Sea of Galilee? Very interesting and suspicious indeed, and of course you have the Nile over there. But are you in denial about all of this or are your eyes opening and are you awakening to the truth and doing more research extensively on your own time about these subjects? Now this gives another major body of water in Africa as you can see right here in this map. There are perennial rivers and non-perennial rivers that are listed and located here. And what you start to notice is that what these rivers pretty much cover and span all of Africa almost. Now again, why is that such an important detail? Why is this so important? Because what this is trying to show you is that there is a story here. And the story here is that all of these rivers are connected one by one. They are interchained and interconnected, linked together one by one. Knowing this fact is going to help us pinpoint and locate the four different rivers of Eden as it's commonly known and also even a starting point. Now we're going to go over the four rivers together and now we're going to get a better understanding of the geographical, historical, scriptural, academic, and geographical location of where the four rivers could be located today and their starting point. Now the first one was Payashun or commonly known as Pishon. Now notice how it also said in that verse from Brashia through Genesis chapter 2 how this river is located where? In the land of gold. In a region called Kuyala commonly known as Havila of today. Well, do we see these regions today? Let's find out because as we've gone over extensively in our documentary, well, what about the land of Aurpar or commonly known as Ophir? Brashith Genesis chapter 10 verse 29 through 30 is another precept that we have to this and it says in Aupar or Ophir in Kuyala Havila remember we just saw that in Brashith Genesis chapter 2 and Yubab all these were sons of Yucatan or Joktan and their dwelling place was from Mesha as you go towards Sapar, a mountain of the east so we see Ophir the land of Ophir in the land of Havilah as it's known today that they are what synonymous and interchangeable that they are near each other so where are they today according to ancient maps because while the lion Zionists want you to think that Havilah is somewhere in Yemen and so is Ophir no it is not we're going to show you exactly where it is and we've also quoted in the documentary 1 Kings 10.11 which reads, And the navy also of Kayaram or Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. Second Chronicles 9.10 reads, And the servants also of Kayaram or Hiram, and the servants of Shaluma or Solomon, which brought gold from Ophir, brought algum trees and precious stones. Now here is a map from 17 
1955, this map is well over 250 years old. That lets us know something that's very important. It says right here, this part of the continent about Sofala is with great reason supposed to be the ancient land of Ophir. So once again, these ancient maps are telling you exactly where Ophir really is. Where? In so-called Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique, as it's commonly known today, right off the coast of Mozambique. Another map that was documented in 1754 also shows Ophir right here. Where does it show it? In southern Africa. Why is that so important? Is because you have to understand that the land of Ophir is what? The land of gold, ancient gold. And then here's the map from 1799 that also shows Ophir in Safala near Mozambique, southern Africa. So now we have not one, not two, but at least three different witnesses that pinpoint Ophir, the land of gold, being in so-called Southern Africa today. And not only that, but we also even have academic sources that prove the exact same thing. But what if Tarshish, as it's commonly known, is actually near Ophir in Southern Africa? Because this is going to help us pinpoint what Kuyala, or the land of ancient Havilah, and once once we do that, then we'll be able to figure out one of the rivers of Eden that's in this location today. Now we've gone over much of this in the documentary, but once again, we will be reiterating it. In September of 1871, German geographer Karl Mauch is said to be the quote-unquote first European explorer to explore the region of Great Zimbabwe containing scriptural Ophir. And of course, they were not there exploring anything. They were there to hide the artifacts, hide ancient artifacts of scripture, burn original maps, murder the people that were there that knew the truth at that time. Time and then create and establish their false fake fraudulent one and bring those stolen artifacts to the fake Israel that you see today and sell you a lie. Now, Karl Mauch and other scholars have noted about this region will prove and attribute Great Zimbabwe and Sofala, Mozambique to be the scriptural Ophir in Tarshish or Tharashayash in Yaudith, respectively. Now, the reason we're going over this is, again, so we can get a better idea of the four rivers of Eden and where the first one actually is. We're not going to go over all of the details and the research because we've already done that in the documentary, but what we will go over is the research done by Augustus Keene. Now again, everything that you're looking for when it comes to this is located in the documentary, including the sources. You can find those sources here, and if you would like, I can also link them in this video when it comes to ancient Ophir and all of the sources that were documented about Ophir being in Zimbabwe today. But before we get to Augustus King, here's another source that we actually looked at from Hall and Neal in 1904, page 87 from the documentary. You will see that countless sources identify Rhodesia, or commonly known today, Zimbabwe, as the Ophir of Scripture. You see right here where it says, numerous authorities such as Bruce Hewitt, Quartermere and Gillian, as well as the great majority of later writers on the Rhodesian ruins, Rhodesia is known today as Zimbabwe, and considering the historic gold output of this country, favor the claims of Monomotapa, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, to be the Ophir of Scripture. So once again, we have multiple witnesses to establish this matter. Not just one, not just a few, but multiple. And again, we have sources that document well over hundreds of years old, maps that are what, over 250 years old. Again, scripture told us that the first river of Eden would be located in a region where there is a ton of gold. This George Bacon map from 1900 show colonists charting gold and other mines and resources in where southern Africa near so-called South Africa, because there's Pretoria, as commonly known as the capital of so-called South Africa today. But you see right above it, there's gold, iron, gold fields. What are they doing that for? Do they know the truth about this region? But this is what I really wanted to get to because in the 1901 book, The Gold of Ophir, whence brought and by whom, Augustus Henry Keene, who was a professor by the way, makes the following claims. 
Again, all of this research will be linked in the description box below so you can see it on your own time. But from page 102 of Keen's findings, Keen has even called Tharshish or Tharashayash Tarshish the outlet of Havilah. Pay attention to that. Outlet of Havilah, Kuyala. Didn't we just read about Havilah in Genesis chapter 2, which would identify it with Sophala or Bera, which is in Mozambique, or any other convenient station on the Costa de Caffres of the ancient maps? And you'll see that on ancient maps from like the 15 or 1600s, this is located where in southern Africa. But on page 102 of Keene's research, Keene identifies Sophala and Bera, Mozambique, as the the Tarshish or Havilah regions of scripture. But again, so we can get another witness to back this up, if we go to page 195 to 196, we will also see in the same source that what it says right here, Tarshish was the outlet for the precious metals and precious stones of Havilah. Didn't we just read in Brashid Genesis chapter 2 that this region was also known for its stones as well and stood probably near the site of Sephala? Now, in that same source, on page 198, Keene actually drew a map, and this map comes from 1901, so again, well over a hundred years ago. But you will see right here that scriptural Havilah is identified right there as Rhodesia or Zimbabwe today. You'll also see that on this map right here, that the Rashayash, or commonly known as Tarshish, is located in where? Safala, Mozambique, in scriptural Ophir, and as we've gone over in another source from the documentary that Punt is also nearby as noted by a different scholar. But do you see something that's very important about this map? Because we see that Havilah's right here, so we see there's a scriptural location and a scriptural match. We also know that according to the source that Ophir, the land of gold, is nearby, so we see that's another scriptural source. But do you see something else? You see a river right here? Could this be one of the four rivers of Eden right here? Because didn't it say that it goes through this land? Land right there and what river is that today the Zambezi River as we just saw on the map so we saw that from Professor Augustus Henry Keene that was done back in 1901 that the Zambezi River is the area that goes through Kuyala or Havila today traveling through the land of gold or what Ophir in Zimbabwe so we see that this is one of the four rivers of Adana today or Eden but what you will also start to note and realize is that what just like the 1411 map told you that what these rivers are connected and these rivers are connected either by tributaries or either by streams they are connected to one another and this is a geographical and also an academic fact as I'm about to share with you right now now here what I'm about to do is share with you more about the Zambezi River. If you would like to learn more about it, you can definitely research it on your own time. We're not going to go over too much of this, but what I did want to share with you is the history of this from what they tell us. Now again, we have to use discernment with everything that they tell us. Now, when you go to the geological history, what you will see is that the upper Zambezi River, and again, the lies that they tell you is that, oh, it formed millions of years ago. No, it's only a couple thousand years old. But what? The upper Zambezi River used to flow south through what is now the Matgadi Gadi Pond to the Limpopo River. So the important thing about this to note is that what? The Zambezi River is connected to the Limpopo River. And as you just saw on the map, here is the Zambezi River right here that goes all the way through as it's commonly known Zimbabwe today and then the Limpopo River that splits and goes through so-called South Africa today. These two rivers are connected. So really, they're really technically one river. They're one and the same. But again, because of all the name changing, because of the colonizers and all of the evil that they did, of course, they made it seem like that they're two separate rivers and two separate branches. But really they are connected this area being what one of the rivers of Eden 
But in case you do not prefer Wikipedia, well, that's all right, because we're going to take you to the actual document and the actual research report that was done by Professor Andrew Gowdy of Oxford University, as you can see right here. Now, this was published in Geomorphology, and this was published in 2005, entitled The Drainage of Africa Since the Cretaceous, and this was done as of 2004 and published in this article as of 2005. Now, it's about 20 pages long. We're not going to go over all of it, but what I will take you to is page 449. Now, this is page 449 that says the Zambezi right here, and it lets us know that right here in the highlighted portion, the upper and middle Zambezi are thought to have evolved as separate systems with the upper Zambezi previously joined to the Limpopo system and the middle Zambezi to the Shire system. So what? This is letting you know that once upon a time, the upper Zambezi joined together with the Limpopo River that once once upon a time, they were what? They were coherent and they were one. But over time, they once upon a time split into separate rivers and separate regions as we have seen. And again, when scripture was written, it was written, what, thousands of years ago and took place thousands of years ago? The maps might have looked different back then. Rivers might have looked different back then. It might have not looked like it looks today, especially when it was before the flood as well. So again, we have to keep these things in mind and take that into consideration. But I will leave this in the description box below. This is the only part that I wanted to quote from this source, but again, these are from actual scholars themselves. These are from actual professors of actual universities. So this comes from a professor at Oxford University. That first source that we showed you from Professor Augustus Henry Keane Keane was a professor at University College London and then also was part of the Royal Geographical Society and also this source right here, Andrew Gowdy, is a geographer as well. So again, these are actual sources that are telling you that what? That the Limpopo and that the Zambezi rivers once were connected and not only that, but they were connected in a region known as Ophir, known as Havila, as it's commonly known today, one of the four rivers of Eden found. So that's the first river of Eden that we've just gone over known as the Payashun or Pishon today within this region which is more than likely attributed today as the Zambezi River and also more than likely the Limpopo River if not both of them because once again once upon a time they were all interconnected. So that's the first one. So now we're going to be going over the second one which is Gayakun or the Gihon River. Now, notice how scripture said that that river is where in Cush or Ethiopia, the land of Cush, or as it's commonly known today as Ethiopia. Well, that's part of the deception and part of the problem of today is that they make you think that, oh, Ethiopia, that's talking about how Ethiopia looks today, the country Ethiopia. However, how did Ethiopia actually look according to scripture? Because once upon a time, Ethiopia itself was much bigger bigger than the country known today. This is a map from Princeton University from their website from Sebastian Munster from 1554. So this map is well over 450 years old. Now we've gone over this map in the documentary actually because we talked about how scriptural Amon is located right there as you can see. And then you see a giant right here. We talked about why that's so important, how giants were in Central Africa because we know that the children of Yasharal and encountered them so we know that the real Jerusalem can be nowhere in this region because the children of Yasharal or Israel encountered giants in Central Africa before making their way to the promised land in so-called Southern Africa plus you see all of the scriptural animals in this region as well. But you see something else about this map that stands out, and what is it? Well, when you take a look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia is known as what? Ethiopia is referring to the entire continent. It's not just referring to this little bitty country over here. No, it's referring to the entire continent. As you can see, once upon a time, Ethiopia was known as all of Africa. 
This is a 1584 map from Abraham Ortelius, and this map is so very important for a few reasons. Now, the main reason today that we're going over in this video specifically is the fact of what Ethiopia. Now, what you will start to notice about this map, if we just enlarge it a little bit, if you take a look over here, what does that say about this map? It will tell you right here. And we've zoomed in so you can see it. And again, you can find this at the Princeton website. But here you see what the ocean Ethiopia, the what the Ethiopian Ocean. Why is this known as the Ethiopian Ocean? Because what is it referring to? Once upon a time, what was Ethiopia? We've gone over this cartographer very extensively in the documentary, but this is from 1635, a map by Willem Blau right here. And as you can see, this map shows what? Ethiopian Ocean right there. So once again, we see that Ethiopia was pretty much known as all of Africa, and there was even the Ethiopian Ocean that was documented on ancient maps. Ancient maps that are what? Well over 400 years old. This one nearly 400 years old as well. Now another important map, and this one once again is from Princeton, so the previous maps that we've just shown you, you can actually find on the Princeton website, but here is one from 1710 from cartographer Herman Mall. Now we've gone over why Herman Mall's maps are very significant for a ton of reasons, but you see what? Ethiopia right here and it looks like Ethiopia is known as a large region now Ethiopia covers Central Africa right here as you can see so once upon a time it extended but now in this map as you keep going towards the 1700s now it encompasses this area but not only that when you take a look you see what this says right here the Ethiopian Sea very interesting and suspicious indeed do you see what this is telling you because when you zoom in just a little bit you actually see it on the coastline of Western Africa as it's known today if you keep going there's the Ethiopian Sea that is located right there and then if we zoom over just a little bit which I'm gonna do right now here you see Ethiopia pretty much encompassing all of Central Africa where it says this country is wholly unknown to the Europeans but then what happened seven years later? Because here we are at a 1737 map from Johann Matthias Hayes. And this map shows you all of Africa, but it also shows you something else. Because when we zoom in on the map right here, it shows you what? Ethiopia. And it shows it in ginormous letters right here. So that's letting you know that it encompasses a ginormous part of Africa, Ethiopia, but then it says superior and it says interior right there. So you see that it has multiple parts right there. So that's another reason why this map is so important. But what's very interesting and suspicious indeed about all of this is that what seven years later, now all of a sudden the ocean is no longer known as the Ethiopian Ocean or the Ethiopian Sea. Now all of a sudden it's changed to what? It's changed to the Atlantic Ocean as you can see right here so what do you see you see how now all of a sudden it's known as the Atlantic Ocean why do you think they started changing things so about the time of the 1700s or the mid 1700s is when they started changing things and started to try to hide and conceal scriptural evidence and scriptural maps at this time and started changing the names as they did right here now there's one quick thing I wanted to note about the maps in southern Africa because what you will start to note especially if you look at all of them that's bracketed and listed on the Princeton website and we will link that in the description box below what you will start to notice actually is something very interesting and suspicious indeed about the southern Africa region as it's commonly known today this is the map from Ortelius that was done in 1584 so well over 400 years ago what you start to see is that in the southern region as it's commonly known today below the equator that what it looks pretty much filled in there are cities and towns and regions and names for these places pretty much all throughout the south you see the area that's known as Agog is that the real scriptural Agog of giants as we just saw with the picture of the giant in that region very interesting and suspicious indeed there but then even in the 1635 map you see right 
right here all throughout the southern Africa region along the Congo and that region you see how what it's pretty much marked you see a ton of towns that are named. You see a ton of regions and places. There's Agog once again. You see how all of these places are named and they have areas. There's Cephala right there near Agog as we've just gone over. So we know that that's what the land of Ophir. You see all of the rivers right here as we've just gone over. You see this region in southern Africa. But again, see how they all have names and regions. And again, this map is from 1635 from William Blau. But then what happens when you go to a map from 1787? When you go to a map in 1787, this is what it starts to show. Now you'll actually see right here, it does mention the Ethiopian Ocean right there. Huh, that's interesting. But it only shows a few places and regions over here. It looks pretty much empty. Th that that's not how it looked in the 1500s. There was more places and regions that were shaded in in the map. Now, all of a sudden, places are what? Hidden and concealed. Why is that the case? Because this map is from 1787. And this is a map from Cary from 1805. So in the 1800s, now all of a sudden, the southern part of Africa below the equator as it's known today, now all of a sudden it's unknown. And folks, you can find these maps on the Princeton website. This is available on the Princeton website. How you can see from the 1580s from a map right here that below the equator, all of this region is shaded in. It's well known. All of it even down to the coastlines down here here but now all of a sudden in the 1800 all these parts are unknown do you see the bigger agenda there very interesting and suspicious indeed of how they were what concealing the truth about these parts because they know that this area which is mostly the Kalahari Desert is the real scriptural Jerusalem I just found that very interesting and suspicious indeed and wanted to note it to you and again wanted to add that as a bonus but going back to the four rivers of Eden so we just looked at the second one and the second one is what? Gayakun or the river Gihon well, that is what located in the area of the land of Kush or as it's commonly known Ethiopia which encompasses the entire continent or throughout the entire Central Africa region which is more than likely the Congo River of today because as you also saw from one of the maps that Ethiopia pretty much encompassed all of Central Africa which is what this region right here. So one of the rivers today would probably be over here around the Congo River and the region located here. Now again, before we go on to the third river, if you just need another visual, here's one from the 1710 Herman Mall map right here. As you can see, Ethiopia pretty much encompasses all of Central Africa that's right near the Congo region and again, also contains the so-called African Great Lakes. Could even those Great Lakes, could they have been known as rivers at one time? And could they even be connected to the four rivers of Eden as well? Huh, very interesting and suspicious indeed, but the Main river that goes through here as you can see today is known as the Congo River so we know that it is in this region somewhere over here now the third river is the Kadakal or commonly known as the Hidakel River also known as the Tigris River today now according to scripture they said that this river is east of Assyria now keep that in mind because we're going to attribute this river to the Nile River today and why are we going to do that you're going to find out in just a moment to come now as we've gone over in the documentary about scriptural Babylon and the real scriptural Babylon and we've even covered that in our True Location series, a two-part on Babylon. Why is it important for scriptural Babylon to be on the Nile? Because is the Nile River also a scriptural river that they don't want you to know and is actually one of the four rivers of Eden? Or are you still in denial about what you're actually seeing? 
And we've already shown all of the ancient Babylon maps and documentaries before and how Babylon is located where in the Nile region actually in Sudan and even in as it's commonly known today Cairo Egypt where we've already gone over that we're not going to go over it again but today we're going to be looking at another scriptural verse in the Thura or Torah and Brashith Genesis 10 verses 10 through 11 that says and the beginning of his reign concerning Nimrod was Babal and Arak in Akkad, and that's important too, and Kalna in the land of Shinar or Shiner. From that land he went to Ashashur or Assyria and built Nayanua, Nineveh, and Rehoboth Er and Kalak. Well, as we've gone over in the documentary, where is the land of Shiner today? According to ancient maps from the 1800s, well over 200 years ago, where is Shiner or Sinar as it's known in the Greek? It's along the Nile River in Sudan. That's where this region is, as you can see right here from a map from 1806 along the Nile, the Nile identifying it as our third river of Eden. Here is another map from 1820 that shows you the same thing nearly 200 years ago. What Sinner Shiner in Sudan right there south of Nubia as it's commonly known. In fact, that town is still a town today. Sinner or the land of Shinar is still a town today in Sudan. This was the kingdom as of 1750 right here. You see how it extended within the two Niles right there? You see that? Not only that, but you see it's also where on the Blue Nile in Sudan. Again, the Nile being what? The Tigris River, the ancient Tigris River. Remember the cartographer Herman Mall? Because the map from 1730 that was done by this cartographer showed something even more important and you're going to see what it is. But as you can see right here on the map, and I'm actually going to let it play, this is from 1730, you see Tigris is shown, and then you see Shiner right there, or Susa, Susa, you see that, but what, Tigris right there in Ethiopia, or what, the Nile River. Here's another map that shows the Tigris right there. As you can see, Tigra right there, and then Sinar or Susa, which is Shiner right there, in Media over there, westward over there. So you see what? It has in common what? The Nile River. And we know that the Nile River, part of it flows into so-called Ethiopia as the country is known today. Is this the real Tigris River? Now in the documentary, we also covered a 1640 map that comes from Marion Matthouse. As you can see right here, this map shows the Tigris or Tigray right here. It also shows it being near media, scriptural media, where in of the area of Cameroon, Chad, and Niger. And it also shows Agog over here. So we see that this region extended well into Africa at one point as well. And like we've also mentioned in the documentary, since Brashith Genesis 2.14 says that Hittakel, known in Old Persian as Tigra, or in the Greek Tigris, it's located east of Assyria. So there it is right there, the Tigris right there, the Tigris River that is what? The Nile River. Because as you can see right here on this map, head or eyes of the River Nile in Ethiopia, but what, the entire Nile River near the land of Sinar or Susa in Sudan. Now here is a map that we were able to trace when it comes to seeing Tigris. It comes from Abraham Ortelius, and this map was done as of 1603, so well over 400 years ago. Now this map is important for several reasons because when you actually zoom in on the map, this is what you will find right here. So when we zoom in, we start to see a few things right here. Is could we also see reference to what Ethiopia once again? But if you zoom up, you see a Gog right there, as you see over here. But if we keep going, we actually see the Tigra being mentioned twice right here, which I thought was very interesting to note. We see it mentioned once right here towards the Nile, and you see the Nile drawn that's right here. So you see how both rivers are connected of the Nile, the blue and the white. But you also see it again over here with the 
spelling. So you see it twice right here, once over there and then once over here, letting us know that it's what? It encompasses this entire region of the Nile and that's so very important to note and I wanted to add that in here just so that you have a better idea of it and just so that you can see it and if we have space in the description box because there are a ton of links we will link this as well just so that you will be able to see it also on your own time this 1750 French map shows the Nile source right here with Sinar over there and you see the source of the Nile River right here but then it also shows Tigri or what the Tigris in Ethiopia as part of the Nile River but then it goes on to show the source of the Nile. Now before we go more over the Nile River sources and how it connects to the real Euphrates River aka the Niger River, before we go over that we're going to go over how this river is the right one because again scripture says that this river is east of Assyria well where is the real scriptural Assyria is it in that fake Syria that they sell you today in the Middle East or is it in Africa well let's find out because remember we did a video on ancient Assyria back in December of 2018 and if you would like you can take a look at that video for more but in that video we covered extensively on ancient Assyria and we also went over the Kebi Chronicles and other academic sources but what was very important is when you take a look at Akkad as it's known or Agadi today it was the capital of the Akkadian Empire now of course they're going to tell you that it's Mesopotamian but really it's something else again note the highlighted part right here because do you see this region located on the map somewhere now again we've gone over this map before when it came to Ethiopia but once again we're going to reference it when it comes to finding and locating and pinpointing the real ancient Assyria because when you look at William Blau's map from 1635 so again a map that's well over 350 years old you'll start to see that what what we just saw Akkad the other name for it you start to see it on this ancient map somewhere here are three places that you see it actually four places you see it here 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 and once again right there Agadiz now again forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation but the reason this is so important is because this map is letting you know that this area in this region that's what that was once known as Libya interior or what today it's commonly known as Niger this is the real ancient Assyria and by the way, just so that you know, it was never actually called Syria or Assyria in scripture. It was always known as Ashashur or Aram. Ashashur, Aram. It was never known as Syria. It was never known as Assyria. Why did they insert that in, adding and taking away? Why did they do that? Because again, they want people to think that it's Syria. That it's the fake Syria in the Middle Eastern region when it is not. So where's this region today? Agadiz or Agadiz right there as you even saw on the map with the exact same spelling of Akkad. Ancient Akkad is where in central Niger today. Now we've already talked about this region in our Assyria video and actually why this region is so important. Why? Because your government and your military they have drone air bases in this region. Why do they need drone air bases in this region? And why does your military need to be here? so they can keep out anybody else who tries to go here and tries to attribute it to scriptural regions in the land of scriptural Assyria and to more than likely go there and hide artifacts, conceal ancient facts and conceal the ancient Assyria and then bring those ancient artifacts to that fake Syria and then sell it to you as the real one. Now this is the bigger region right here which is the administrative region in Niger that accounts for more than 50% of the total area of Niger, the largest of its seven regions as you can see right here located in northern Niger right there so you can see that all of this region once upon a time was known as ancient Assyria so when you go east of there what region do you find? 
Well, according to basic geography, if ancient Assyria, also known as Ashashur, as we've just located on the maps and pinpointed as in Niger, if we've just located ancient Assyria in Niger today, East of Niger brings us to what? This region over here. Because again, scripture said that it's east of Assyria. Well, east of Niger brings us to what? Chad and Sudan, which is what? The region of the Tigris over here that's east of Assyria. So we have a scriptural match and can attribute the Nile as being the Tigris River. And didn't that one source, Aram Naharayim, also tell us of the two rivers? Doesn't the Nile River branch off into two rivers? Very interesting and suspicious indeed. So we have the ancient Nile River being attributed to the Tigris River of Scripture, as we've just noted, with tons of witnesses. But there's probably something else that you probably did not know about the Nile River, because they're going to tell you that, oh, its source is right here. But what if the Nile River extended all the way into so-called South Africa? And remember the 1411 map that we showed you earlier in the documentary, how it looked like what? This was the area of the Garden of Eden and how one of the rivers extended and looked to be the Nile River. Very interesting and suspicious indeed. But here's something you probably did not know about the Nile River because now we're going to share with you more about this river and how it could have extended all the way into southern Africa, into so-called South Africa indeed because here we are and we're showing you this town called Matamol, which is what formerly Nile Stroom. Very interesting and suspicious indeed because once upon a time it was not called this, it was called Nile Stroom room or what the Nile stream huh very interesting indeed and again as we've gone over in the documentary they've changed the names of so-called South African cities well over a hundred and thirty four times in certain places in regions and locations why is that the case because they don't want people associating this region with scripture not anymore because what they're going to tell you right now is that it's a town located near the southern edge of the Waterberg Massif in Limpopo province South Africa so-called why is that important to know that it's in the Limpopo region because didn't we just go over from scholarly sources that the Limpopo River is what connected to the Zambezi which is what? One of the scriptural rivers of Eden? You see how they're connected? Wow, it's coming together. But that's not the only thing because it shows it right here and then it shows a map right here in so-called South Africa as it's known today. Around the area where ancient maps pinpointed gold, scriptural gold, all right, so we see that. But there's something else about this that I wanted to bring your attention to, and that's this. In the 1860s, a group of four trekkers known as what? The Jerusalem Trekkers, they went off to find the real land of Jerusalem. After discovering a wide river flowing northwards, they consulted the maps at the back of their scriptures and decided that it was the Nile River. They called the stream Nile River and then went to the town and called it Nile Stream in 1866. After discovering what they believed to be a ruined pyramid, they were convinced that they had found the Nile. It was in fact the natural hillock known to the locals as Matamal. But what if they actually did find the Nile and that it extended all the way down to so-called South Africa as it's commonly known today? Or should I say all the way up to that region? But why is this all connected? Because what you start to see is that what? They were looking for the real land of Jerusalem in the 1860s. Isn't it very interesting how in the 1860s there are how many maps that attribute Jerusalem within the same region? In fact, the earliest map is shown found in 1844 that shows this about Jerusalem that gives us a scriptural match. 
We've gone over this in our Jordan River documentary. We're not going to go over it again, but we will link it in the description box so that you will be able to see it on your own time. Right now, this is a map from 1844 that is so-called South Africa by James Wild. Now, if you do more research on cartographer and geographer James Wild, you will see that James Wild was what? A geographer to the king and queen of England at that time, or should I say the serpent reptilian bloodline because they know the truth about this region but guess what so do we because if you zoom in on this map this is what you start to see and by the way this is the earliest map that shows Jerusalem and where does it show Jerusalem in southern Namibia near so-called South Africa because this is what it shows right here Riedeburg or Jerusalem and you see right here how it shows what desolate plains desolate desolate Desolation. Doesn't the word of our creator say that Jerusalem today would be a desolation with no inhabitants according to Jeremiah, ooh, Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 11 through 12 and it shows desolate plains over here. You see how it's a scriptural match? It cannot be that one, that fake one that they're selling you because there are inhabitants there and there are no jackals there and it's not desolate. And this was in the 1860s that they were trying to do that, that these Jerusalem trekkers were trekking for the real land in the 1860s. And it just so happens that they were doing it in the same region where ancient Jerusalem is located and pinpointed on a map. And we have all of the 18 maps right here that's linked. And we're going to link them once again. That is if we have space to link them in this video in the description box. But if not, you can find it in our ancient Jordan River location video that was done, which was the true locations video that was done before this one. But it's interesting how that trek took place during the 1860s. Now what's also very interesting and suspicious indeed is that none of these maps were actually done and drawn in the 1860s itself. Now again, if you would like to see these maps, you can do so in our documentary where we show 16, but since then two have been found and we just showed you this one from 1844. Now what's interesting is that as of the 1860s, so during that time, there had already been at least least one map that was done in 1854 and then there was another map in 1858 that showed Jerusalem and then it also showed 1844 this one so about three maps had already come out that showed Jerusalem in southern Namibia as it's commonly known today near so-called South Africa and near that Nile River region. Again, it's important to note the timing of all of this. Is that a surprise or a coincidence? I don't think so, because if you go here, there's actually a river that's called the Nile River. It's just spelled a little bit differently. The Nile River, which is a watercourse in Limpopo province, so-called South Africa, right there. Now, again, we told you to pay careful attention how all of these rivers are connected to one another. So you see the Nile River right here. You see how it's at the head of this river right there, the Mogalakwena River. And we've already gone over how the name originated in the word Nile in the 1860s. Again, the Dutch Vortrekkers known as Jerusalem Gangers looking for the real Jerusalem and how they found the Nile River and called it Nile Strum or Matamol in this region. So again, we see how all of this is connected. Of course, they're going to try to make it seem like, oh, no, this is not connected to the Nile River. Or, oh, they're two separate things or, oh, they're different. That's what they want us to think. That's what they want us to believe but now we're finding the truth and we're seeing the truth with both our eyes open but the other thing I wanted to note right now actually is how these rivers are connected because you see right here that the Nile River is connected to this one the Mogalak Wina River so when you go to this one this is what you find now again, what we're doing right now is we're kind of doing a river trail and how they connect. So you just saw the Nile River in so-called South Africa. But again, this is how they twisted everything. But now we're connecting the pieces together because they just told you that the Nile River connects to this river right here, which is the Mogalak Wina River. When you actually go to that river, this is what you find, that it's one of the main watercourses in the Limpopo province of so-called South Africa. But how it's also a major tributary 
of the Limpopo River. So you see that this river is connected to the Limpopo River. So the Nile River in YL, that one's connected to this river, and this river's connected to the Limpopo River. And we just told you, and we just went over the scholarly source, how the Limpopo River is connected to the Zambezi River. Here is the picture of the Mogalic Wena River that's located in southern Africa today. So in places such as Botswana, Zimbabwe, so-called South Africa, and Mozambique over here. Now you'll see it's in the northern part over there. Here is the actual river right here, the Mogalic Wena right there that flows all the way right here and keeps going all the way down. You'll see that again, there are a bunch of other rivers that are connected to this major river source right here that goes all the way and is connected again to the Limpopo River because it's a major tributary. And one of the rivers that's connected, as we just read, is the Nile River of so-called South Africa that's also located in this region. So here's the Limpopo. And then if you just go a little bit north, you'll get to what? The Zambezi River as well. And we know that the Limpopo was once upon a time connected to the Zambezi River according to scholarly sources. And then you have the so-called African Great Lakes. Could those rivers be connected to the African Great Lakes? And then, of course, if you keep going and keep trailing the African Great Lakes, you get the Nile River of today that's connected to the African Great Lakes as well. So again, we see how all of these rivers are connected. We see how they're interconnected and linked together with scholarly sources to back it up and with the tributaries bearing witness as well. So more than likely, the Nile River of so-called South Africa is actually connected to the Nile River that extends from what's known today as Egypt all the way to Uganda. They are connected somehow, some way. Now, if you do not prefer Wikipedia for sources, well, you can go right here in this source at the Niles Valley Nature Reserve to learn more about what we just talked about when it comes to the Nile in so-called South Africa and the Jerusalem trekkers. For research purposes, you can also take a look at this book right here from the History of South Africa that comes from George McCall Thiel that's located right here that was around from 1837 to 1919. And you'll see right here, this tells more about what the Nile Strum in so-called South Africa in this book right here as another source. And these books will be linked in the description box below along with other helpful tools and research. The fourth and final river that we're going to be going over today before talking about the source and origin and the potential origin of these four rivers is, of course, the Euphrates River, or also known as Paratha in the ancient Yaudiath language. And according to ancient sources, you're going to see how it's actually the Niger River and how the Niger River is attributed to the River Euphrates along with the Benu and Volta Rivers mentioned as well. Not only that, but you're also going to see how what this river is connected to the Nile. But where are our sources for the Euphrates River attributing the Euphrates to the Niger River of today? Well, we actually have a few sources right here as we've gone over before extensively and we're going to cover again. In the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 32, page 395, that was published in 1918, well over a hundred years ago. Because it says right here in this paragraph, in this kingdom of Eminuan, there enters a branch of the river Euphrates, Niger. The friar does not confuse this with the Mesopotamian Euphrates, but assumes two rivers with the same name. And we've gone over that again, how your elite have played cover up because they know that there are two Euphrates rivers. So again, the question is, which one is the scriptural one? But it goes on to say that this river forms three branches. You see branches, how they are connected. One is entering the middle of the kingdom of Aminuan and the other branches flowing round the whole kingdom, the width in some places being two days journey. 
When I crossed this great river, I first made a long journey along its banks, which are very populous, referring evidently to the river Benu. What a tributary of the Niger. So you see what? The Benu and the Niger. The Benu and the Niger. How they connect with one another. So when you take a look at the map of Africa today, you actually see how these rivers connect. There's the Benu and there's the Niger, or should I say the real Euphrates River and how they connect and extend all the way throughout this region of Africa over here. Do you see the Euphrates on ancient maps? Well, let's find out because here's one from Delisle that comes all the way from 1707. And now we've actually been able to not only pinpoint where the Euphrates is, but we also have the actual link for it, which will be linked in the description box as well. So this map comes from 1707, well over 300 years ago. But when you enlarge the map, this is what you will actually find because here we are in southwestern Africa right here. So we're towards the region of Cote d'Ivoire or towards Ghana as well as it's commonly known today. But when we zoom over just a little bit and when we go up in the ancient kingdom of Judah, because remember, they migrated northward towards this region. What do you see right there? The Euphrates River. And again, this is all the way from 1707 in Western Africa towards Ghana region. Again, around the what? The Niger River. This was the map in our documentary, but I would just like to make a correction because I said that in the documentary that it was from Delisle from 1747. Actually, this map is from 1742, and this was a Colvin's Mortier edition that had done their own edition of that same map from 1707. They just did an edition about 35 years later in 1742. So again, still well over 250 years ago. And as you can see right here, there's the Euphrates River, and you see that it's located in the Western Africa region near the Niger River. And again, we just went over how what? That river, the Benu, is a tributary of the Niger, meaning that it is connected to the Niger River, meaning that long river is what? The Euphrates River. It's in this region over here. And again, we have not one, not two, but now three witnesses to back this up oh but there's another one because there's always more but wait there's more because here is a 1747 map so again well over 250 years old and you see what the river euphrates right there near the kingdom of judah in western africa so you see right there that is the euphrates and see how it extends all the way through so-called ghana as it was known at the time you see how it extends all the way upward toward what the niger river so it's all within the same region now again, a few important things to note about the so-called Niger River. What you will start to notice is that in Central Africa, the land was populated by Yaudium, or commonly known as Jews, because we know that they're dark skin. But what you will also see that what? Nile of the Negroes. It even says it right there. Nile of the Negroes, according to geography by what? Ptolemy right there. But as you can see right here in Central Africa that's noted on ancient maps and geographers and cartographers have noted this before hundreds of years ago, how you see ancient media right there, you see it right there, emeralds near this region. This is a region in Central Africa. But then it says right here, and this point is very important where it says some geographers believing the Niger to be a branch of the Nile have therefore called it the Nile of the the Negroes. The Niger River is the Nile of the Negroes and a branch of the Nile, a branch, just like a tree branch. They're all connected. So you see how the Niger River is a branch of the Nile according to this source and geographers have already noted this and have noted how the Niger is not only a branch of the Nile but how it's connected to the Nile. Well, when you know what these rivers really truly are, then you start to understand, didn't we just go over that what the Nile River is really the Tigris River and the Niger River is really the Euphrates and how they are connected to one another, a branch of it? 
Again, that's so very important to note how they are connected to one another, how the Niger is connected to the Nile, or should I say the Euphrates is connected to the Tigris and how the real Tigris River extends all the way down into so-called South Africa, how the real Nile River extends all the way down into so-called South Africa as we've just proven in this video today. So what have we learned so far? Well, we've learned and we know that names have been changed, maps have been removed, maps have been burned of the ancient maps of Africa, so-called, and we know that the four rivers are attributed to rivers in Africa. We also know that these rivers are connected to one another, the major ones, and we also know that they're connected to one specific source that make up the source of the Garden of Eden as it's known today. We know that more than likely that the names of the real Tigris River was more than likely the Nile River that extends all the way towards southern South Africa as it's commonly known because it goes all the way from southern region all the way over here. Now they tell us that the Nile River as we know as the Tigris River stops right here and that its source is all the way here in the African Great Lakes. But if the African Great Lakes really connect to one another and we know that the Zam Zambezi River connects to the Limpopo River as we just read in sources and the Nile River in so-called South Africa NYL River is actually connected to the Limpopo River then we see exactly that they are connected together. We've also learned that the Benu River is a tributary of the Niger River and that this is the Euphrates River over here, but it just so happens to be connected to the Nile, or should I say the Tigris River. We also know that the Zambezi River is more than likely attributed to the River of Payashun or Pizon River where in the land of Kuyala have a lot of gold and we know there is a significant amount of gold in this region along Ophir or commonly known as Zimbabwe today which is why the Chinese are so interested in that region today. We also know that the Gayakun or the Gihon River is more than likely attributed to the Congo. Why? Because we saw ancient maps of Ethiopia being in this region as scripture also talks about and we know that this has to be the Tigris River known as the Now because scripture says that it's east of Assyria well we just looked at ancient maps and we know that Assyria ancient Assyria today is located in Niger today and again if you would like to learn more you can pause the video and go back or you can think about it think about it think about it think about it